Thanks to modern media, our idea of Satan and Lucifer are one and the same, but there's a big difference between the two, and the devils in the details. In the popular imagination, the devil is all over the Old Testament. Most infamously, he tempts Adam and Eve to sin through the snake in the Garden of Eden, and he challenges the Lord in the Book of Job. But in fact, there is no devil or any devil-like thing in the Old Testament. The word Satan appears throughout the books in the original Hebrew, but it's a title, not a name. The title Satan translates from Hebrew as adversary or accuser. The term Hasatan is used to describe several figures in the Old Testament. It literally means the adversary. Hasatan is how the angel of the Lord that appears before Balaam in Numbers 22 is described. The Satan of Job is an accuser, an angel who chastises man before God and presents tests in accordance with God's express wishes. Zechariah 3 sees the Lord rebuking Satan before the high priest Joshua in Zechariah's visions. But even here, Hasatan is used, implying that it is yet another adversary playing a prosecutorial role. These adversarial Satans worked on God's behalf, not against him. Within Judaism, the idea of the devil as the great evil of creation was developed in the Talmud and the tradition of Kabbalah. This Satan as we commonly think of him appears in the Talmud, though he's sometimes conflated with other supernatural figures. And the Kabbalistic texts describe the demon realm and the magical means to fight its denizens. These writings brought the Jewish conception of the devil closer to the Christian image. There's a common interpretation that the first and last books of the Bible are connected by the representations of the devil. The snake who tempts Eve with a forbidden fruit is seen as Satan come among the innocent in the Garden of Eden, and the seven-headed red dragon of Revelation 12 is a representation of the devil in a vision. But the snake is never actually called the devil, Satan, Lucifer, or anything close to that. It's just the serpent, albeit a talking one, and it's punished for its part in man's downfall by the loss of its legs. Oh, went down like a lead balloon. The notion of a malevolent evil being in opposition to God wasn't yet part of the Abrahamic tradition when Genesis was written. That came in later centuries, with the rise of Jewish apocalyptic literature that carried into the early Christian period. As the idea of a cosmic struggle for good and evil took root, Genesis was reinterpreted in that light, though the serpent may not have been read as the devil for some time after the books of the New Testament were written. Revelation never ties its many-headed dragon with the serpent of Genesis. Other serpents and dragons mentioned in the Bible, such as the Leviathan of Isaiah, represent human enemies of Israel rather than supernatural ones, and fit comfortably in the family of climactic battles that paint one side as a dragon or serpent. Revelation would fit into this family too, but the silver-tongued tempter of the Garden of Eden stands apart. The devil is often described as a fallen angel cast out from heaven for rebellion against God. As evidence for this interpretation of the devil, some Christians point to two books of the Old Testament, Isaiah and Ezekiel. Satan doesn't appear in either book as such. Both are prophetical works concerned with threats to the kingdom of Judea. But Isaiah 14, 12 through 17 and Ezekiel 28, 14 through 18 are taken to describe the fall of Satan. The relevant passage in Isaiah begins, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Well, the passage in Ezekiel begins, You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. I am the first angel, loved once above all others. Perfect love. But neither passage is explicitly stated to be about the devil, and there's good reason to think neither is. Isaiah 14 was long thought to be about Satan, and is the biblical source for the name Lucifer, the Latin translation of the Hebrew Eleel, or Shining One. But while the traditional interpretation remains, scholarship from the past 200 years has favored seeing Isaiah as a challenge to the king of Babylon and Babylonian exile. And Ezekiel 28 likely refers to Ephbaal II, king of Tyre, though it's held to have a double meaning. So where did this whole fallen angel idea come from? Mainly, John Milton's 17th century work, Paradise Lost. Milton likely used Isaiah and Ezekiel as his inspiration, but it was his epic poem that really put Satan in the mainstream. The temptation of Christ in the wilderness by Satan is relatively consistent across the Gospels. It is notable that Mark, probably the oldest of the four books, gives only a token mention of the incident. John, probably the last Gospel written, doesn't include the temptation at all. In between are Matthew and Luke, which are largely in agreement with what happened. The devil came to Jesus in the wilderness and offered three temptations, and each time was rebuked by Jesus with a quote from scripture. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Other than the order the temptations appear in, Matthew and Luke line up in their accounts of the temptation. 
But The Temptation Story and the two books as wholes were aimed at different audiences. Matthew was primarily aimed at Jewish readers, and the temptations and responses are ordered in a way that naturally works its way toward the central notion of the Old Testament, that there is only one Lord God. Luke was more for Gentiles, and the reordered temptations may reflect his focus on Jesus undoing the sins and temptations of all humanity. So in a sense, it's the same Satan, but the audiences interpreted the passage very differently. There's a fundamental problem with the idea of the devil, that an all-powerful, all-loving God should allow such a malevolent being to exist, and that said being should be able to tempt and torment mankind at every turn. Does the very concept of the devil make sense then in the Bible? There is a school of thought within Judaism that regards the Christian idea of Satan as the great evil to be blasphemous. It must be, it is argued, because otherwise God's hand would not be behind all things good or bad. In other words, how can God allow a devil to exist? To answer the question, writers have gone through the Bible and reinterpreted many of the contentious passages, the view being that the devil is the great enemy of man, constantly tempting us, but still a created being who is defeated by the sacrifice of Jesus. They also lean into the view of Satan as a fallen angel, originally created good but rebellious through an act of free will. Why he's allowed to keep rebelling even after the crucifixion has been explained as a showcase for the glory of God, or something that is only temporary for earthly existence. Whether that's a satisfying answer is another matter. As Christians say, God works in mysterious ways.